Um, I'm Josh Jerome. I'm the Community and Economic Development Specialist for the Montpelier, City of Montpelier. And uh, thanks for coming today. Um, you know, it's a beautiful day, so hopefully you can enjoy some of it after. Um, and this, I want to introduce you to Stephanie Clark uh, from White Burke, our consultant firm, uh, who's going to run through the process for the master planning of this property. Um, and then we'll uh, take some questions and comments after, okay? Great. Stephanie? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for coming out. And yes, hopefully you've enjoyed it up to now, and then we're going to get outside and be able to move around a good bit. But thanks for taking a minute. And um, so as, I, as Josh said, I'm Stephanie Clark from White & Burke. My, our consultant team was selected over the summer. There was an RFP process and put out by the city. Our team consists of White & Burke plus VHB and uh, Black River Design, BRD, that is, um, sorry, thank you, <laughs> that is uh, helping to create this master plan. The ultimate goal is an actionable master plan, something that will have next steps, will have forward momentum to seeing a vision put into action. And so that's why our firm was hired, that's what we do is um, development consulting to municipalities. Uh, we've worked with Montpelier extensively before, we're really excited to be back and the beginning of this process is really starting, it started before we got involved. So starting in spring of 2022, there was the vote, of course, and there was a community conversation and the input period that yielded a lot of comments and a lot of different ideas in, about uses and creative uses and opportunities with the property. We have a printout of that feedback on the table, if you um, haven't gotten it, some of you have and that is everything that was received up to September. So that brings us up to the fall. So the fall 2022 process is what we're doing right now, and there's two concurrent paths though. There's the, com the conversation and the continued community input, which we'll get into more today, and we have a series of other meetings happening and other forms of outreach happening to, to gather that input, but also concurrently we're doing the site due diligence. And so the consultant team, specifically VHB, is running the site due diligence for what is happening um, with the property. What are the different um, features of the property? We have an archaeological assessment being done, you know, topography, as you'd imagine, natural resources inventory. And all of that will come together in a, in a memo and in a plan that shows us what the, what the site actually has for characteristics. So we have... This process, which again includes community meetings, stakeholder meetings, we've been doing a lot of communications thanks to Evelyn, who's, who you all probably know, but up at the front desk there, she's been blasting out a lot of communication around this. Continued education and outreach, which we know is important to keep this top of mind and keep people informed. And that is gonna continue while we, on that concurrent path, run the due diligence. But the next, the next phases, just to give you um, a sense of what to expect, is in the winter we expect to come back with an opportunities and constraints plan. And that will show what, where the most likely areas for development might be, the, most, the easiest paths for development, and also the different challenges that come with it from the, the basic parts of the property and elements of the property. And at that time, we intend to have public workshops to really assess then how do the visions for the uses dovetail with what the property can support and the best uses and the highest and best uses for those, but also the pros and cons for where you know infrastructure would be needed and how expensive that might be versus um, what would be the return on that investment. And then from that feedback and from the city council's direction, we intend to bring back a few concepts, um, two to three scenarios and development pathways that the city can then give input on and, and guide as the final actionable master plan. So there is a funnel, really, of what's happening in terms of collecting input and the guidance for how the master plan will come into, into being. I should say, you know, what we'll talk about more today when we're out on site, though, is that it's a big piece of property, and I just want to be, you know, full disclosure, we don't know what we don't know yet, so this, today is not educating about what we found yet, but that is coming once they've had a chance. We have to do a lot of this, we did this kind of, um, had to get going really quickly because the ground freezes, the conditions become 
so, such that you can't do any of the do some of the due diligence you need to do. And so once we have that data, that will be a pr part of the presentation in the winter. So as I said, the input that we have gotten so far is detailed in the handout. And there, were a, there was a lot of consensus for certain um, uses. The vote had been intentionally for housing and recreational opportunities. And so that those obviously came to the forefront. But there were also suggestions around conservation, environmental conservation, natural resources conservation, agriculture, educational opportunities, some retail, and what does that mix look like? And so, you know, as, a, as an example, there has been, there's quite a lot of range that we've seen so far, and I expect we will continue to see, because of people, everybody has different priorities. But we're here to continue to hear that and to take that down, and I keep saying this is my sponge phase, where I really feel like I'm just absorbing a lot of this, I'm, we're taking notes, we're recording this, we're bringing this back to the planning team, and so all of that will get digested, along with you know, our expertise from development perspective, with some you know, highest and best use, best practices that'll get applied as we kind of think about what some of these opportunities may be. And those, by the way, those comments are also on the website. So the web page, which is a sub page of the website, is going to be continue to keep up to date. There are documents on there that have our slide deck from when we pre presented to the city council earlier this week, um, has the feedback from the public. So if any of your peers or your neighbors would like to know more about that, there's a lot on that website mm -hmm. and that will continue to get updated. Where is that website? So if you go to the website, the, the main homepage, there's actually a section as you scroll down dedicated to the Elks that was previously called the Elks. We should talk about that. <laughs> and there will be a link that goes to that. So you're saying on the City of Montpelier website? City of Montpelier website, yes. Thank you for, for clarifying. Um, we are calling this, as you might have seen on the um, signage and on this, that this is the Country Club Road site, which has been, was generally the consensus of the City Council at a meeting this week, that really is a, it's a working title. <laughs> we should just call it that. I think it's a way to recognize the, the place that it's at and everybody can recognize it as such. But that may not be its ultimate site name, but for now, that's what we're calling it. And I think switching it from Elks is gonna be a little bit of a challenge, I, I, I admit. So um, this, really, this is the question we're here for today. So. What we'd like to do after this is open this up for, for input and to hear from everybody um, more ideas, anything that's troubling, anything that's exciting for you um, relative to the site that we get to be here today is such a treat to be able to actually see the property. And we will go out after this once we've had time to have a comment and take a walk. And there's a good number of folks, so we'll split up into some groups. Um, Josh can explain more of that when we get to that phase, but there are different paths to take out. Luckily, there are some nice walking paths here, and you can explain more of that when we get to that point. But it'll give us a chance to get out on the site and talk about it. Yes? Yeah, I just, um, I was looking at your time frame. Obviously, based on the public forum feedback, so you're going to have a preliminary input back to the city in winter of 2023 at one of the council meetings. Yeah. Um, and then your final written report, are you expecting that spring of next year? The time frame is spring 2023, and I say it spring loosely because some of that will be dictated by the public process. If for some reason we don't want to be too hard and fast on that and predict what we don't know, um, because if we get to a point in the winter where more research might be needed, for example, we would want to go back and do some due diligence, and that could delay the time frame. Um, we don't want to rush this. This is not something to be, this is a really legacy opportunity. So I think by the spring, we're hopeful that we'll have that, that concept planning phase so that we can have an actual master plan by late spring, early summer after that process. That's a great question. Um, so, yeah, so this is a, yes, we have another process question, yeah. Oh, just your slide calls this a legacy site. What does that mean? Legacy sites, really, it's a matter of long-term opportunity. Um, long-term opportunity for the community, once in a lifetime is another way of putting it. You know, having such an asset that um, the community owns and controls is something to be taken seriously. So that's, that's typically what's meant for long-term planning. And um, so this is the question we want to get to. I can, I, I'm more likely to leave up this 
slide just because it is a graphic of the site. You can see that we are here today and we will go out and take these trails and walk out on the site after this. Um, but you know, this gives us a good graphic representation of the 130 plus acres um, that we're talking about. And so I really want to stop there because I don't think you need to hear too much more. I'll answer any more questions before we get to the input. Yeah. yeah. So the left end of that lot, mm -hmm. is that the same as the pasture right. Uh, property? Right there. Yeah. Correct. Uh, just one other question. I know that a lot of people come up here and use this for cross-country skiing and stuff like that during the winter. Is, is there still going to be a lot of cross-country skiing or recreational opportunities while we're still planning all this stuff? In the interim, yes. In the interim. Yeah. 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 That's my expectation. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Second. Yeah. So are you saying that the due diligence of, of uh, assessing the actual land ledges and that kind of stuff, you're anticipating getting that done, getting that all started and, and in process before winter? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we hope what's well, done nicely, um, conveniently actually, not I'd love to say I could be responsible for the timing, but it's going to go coincide well with the holiday season. We're not going to start the public process during the holiday season, but that's about when the research will finish up and give us time to go into our planning phase. And then by January, our hope is to come into that season when no one wants to be doing outside things anyway. We can do some the workshops around that. Here and then here. Uh, I know that at City Council, um, some people came and asked about hunting and a decision was made. Can you show where the hunting might be taking place within that boundary? I would imagine that it's anywhere in the boundary in the, in the forested areas. That would be to the far right and to the far left? Yes. Mm -hmm. They're not just in the forest. Well, the amount of people walking in the fields, I heard any hunter might have given up on any field hunting opportunities. So the due diligence at this point, is that is that an environmental assessment of the property? Yes, yeah, it is. And um, everything from natural resources to wetland assessments and um, yeah, rare threatened endangered species, topography, all of the all of the environmental characteristics of the site. Yeah. Soils. Here and then here. Yes. I look on this as you presented us a great big dessert with a hard frosting on top. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's underneath. Mm -hmm. And we all want to know, we all want to think what we know what's underneath. Mm -hmm. But we don't. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd like to see, I'm a professional planner, but I come ignorant of what's on this site. And I don't know what questions to ask because I don't know what's underneath. And you have access to GIS information, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and you've not presented it to us as, as a body. Mm -hmm. And I guess I don't think you're wasting my time and your time by not describing what's underneath this frost, this beautiful landscape we see. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's there, and we don't know its limitations. So why not spend some time and a little bit of your money for easy access to GIS and tell us what the state through the GIS system knows what's underneath. We say think they know. And then we can start talking about what the potentials are and what the limitations are given that data. By your procedure described in this handout, we're going to get that information and you're going to be making decisions given whatever limited input and they may be not what we want. So I guess I'm, I'm criticizing your process. And, and that's fair. What? So that's your, that's your title to that. Um, so I will tell you, I do not have any of that data. So I personally, our firm does not do that work. So we partnered with VHB, and they are busy doing that work. And Who's that takes that time. VHB, they're the firm out of South Burlington. They are doing that work, and it takes time. They started, our contract technically was to start on October 1st. I got started a little early um, because we wanted to get the public back engaged because it had been a while. So the spring process had taken a little while. So we wanted to get back to, while there was 
conditions where we could come out and see the site to get a chance to have continue the conversation as the public. So I don't know that data yet, and when we do know that data, we will be bringing that back along with an opportunity for a lot more conversation. This is just not but the only time for conversation. I guess I didn't see that on that first diagram you presented as to the time frame when there would be constant feedback. Yeah, I guess that's what, if this wasn't as clear as it could have been, this is really the opportunity when we have the data, that's what the Opportunities and Constraints Plan is. It will present what the features are, the questions you guys asked about the environmental features, as well as barriers and challenges that we know, uh, regulatory and such, and anything permit related, as well as then that's the opportunity to have the conversation around the uses and how that will go, how that will fit in. And then there's even further opportunity for more public input after that. Well, I'm, if I may, if I, but part of that community input prioritization is like each of us is sticking our finger in that, through that frosting on the cake and saying, oh, I don't like what's underneath here. But you have a mixture underneath. We don't know what's in that cake. We don't know what is available given you know, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. It is a it is a it is a bit hard to, to paint on a canvas when you don't know necessarily. But I think that there's a balance here of trying to still to still retain um, feedback. But let me ask for example. I think we have we have to take a few. Or go yeah. ahead, Bill. If I may, Bill Fraser, City Manager, I'd like to respond to that. Um, <clears throat> to be honest. The process that you're saying is what their firm initially proposed, which was to get all the data first. And it was actually the city who, who had heard from its residents and from others that the people wanted to be really involved and have multiple chances. So we actually asked them to start this early. And the point of this is to find out what potential uses people have for the highest priority. We don't know exactly where they're going to go yet, but is it housing, is it recreation, is it open space? So when we get that data, we can begin to think about where those things might go and then come back and show that to the public and get reactions. So if you have criticism of the process, I'd please direct it to me and the city and not the folks who are doing what we ask them to do. Well, you know, I worked a while in public uh, citizens' participation. And the model you're suggesting is method how to limit input for citizen participation. This model is just that. It lets the people think they have a lot of input, they take a session like this, then they go away for a while, and then they gel something, what they want, the administration wants, and then they come back and say, oh, this is it, this is what you asked us to do. Well, that's maybe, if, we, that's maybe if the administration and the city knew what it wanted, that would be happening, but we don't. We're interested in hearing what our folks want. Well, all of the models then show certain things come out at the end. And I, I guess what I'm asking is why not make available online the data base that is available and, uh, and have a constant website, starting out with GIS for the site, the respective overlays, the constraints that come out of it, and let the people be up to date as you develop this due diligence. That's, yeah, I mean, we really, we're not gonna, we're not gonna disperse information with every piece, every study we do. I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of pieces of due diligence, and so it would not be responsible to, to put out information in such a, in such a um, different, small, you know, segregated way. Um, it's a comprehensive picture, and we want to make sure we're, we're doing all of the thorough due diligence. I want to be sensitive to time. We do need to make sure everybody gets a chance to be heard, and she's been waiting a while, and then um, we'll go to this gentleman here in the, in the gray. Um, I'm happy to go ahead and move back to the slide where we're talking about, you know, we can, I can still feel questions about process too, but if you want to um, also on the input. So, so. will the GIS and other work that the other party is mm -hmm. doing um, address questions about Ledge and rock and clay and all of that. Yeah, soils and, and um, uh, as much as um, without doing borings, they're not going into borings yet. That's a little advanced at this stage, but to get a sense from um, especially the mapping that is available to look at the um, uh, geotechnical uh, aspects to it. 
because I agree. I think that here is a particular concern. It absolutely would be kind of a bit of a uh, deal killer for you know exactly what we want to get to for the opportunities and constraints plan. We don't want to talk about doing you know multi-use, um, multi-family housing with subterranean parking, for example, if you did townhouses, for example, with parking underneath to minimize surface, you know, you can't do that when you have a lot of ledge. So we don't want to have that. That's exactly why we want to bring those two things together. And so we'll, we'll go to a gray. And then we are going to um, ask the people keep their questions and comments to a few minutes just so everyone has a chance to speak. And we'll, um, we'll make sure everyone has spoken first before we get to people speaking multiple times, if you can appreciate that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Now, I believe that the tip district ended at Savings Pasture, so this yeah. is not included as part of the tip. And do we know what the zoning is? Uh, I don't know what the exact that question whether it would be a question for the rural. Zone. It's the rural zone. It's the rural zone. Okay. Rural zone. okay. Yeah. And I guess the other question would be, depending on what you find, is there a possibility that we could rezone it? To allow for a greater density of housing or something like that or that would absolutely be yeah. a that could be a recommendation that the, okay. that the master plan i think that exactly that, that question gets at what could the actual master plan include would be some recommendations for next phases you know this is going to be the highest and best use can we rezone it and then that would be a step or is it getting a different state designation for this area is it those kinds of steps that would be needed before you can put a shovel on the ground for example Perfect. yeah Thank you. And so we'll go here and then to the gentleman with the gray hat. I do not want to criticize your process. I think it sounds like a, uh, an appropriate way to proceed in order to do you know, to what your objective is, which is to find out the best use for this parcel. Mm -hmm. However, I do think that the city's public interest, more broadly, is that this become, you're using the legacy mm -hmm. concept, that this become something which is tightly, as tightly integrated with the city as possible. Mm -hmm. And I do not see that that objective is part of what your planning process will address. And I've just got a couple of things in that regard that I want to mention. As uh, some may know that I, raised this point with an article I had by Frank that suggested that Savings Pasture really should be the planning for it and the planning for this to the extent possible really should be coordinated. And I understand full well the uh, difficulties of the, the history of it, etc. Um, but it is in a key location between here and the city. Mm -hmm. and particularly with regard to access, the, which, from my point of view, just looking at the site that I walked at and driven and so forth, the current vehicular access is the, the worst feature of this parcel. Mm -hmm. And there would be a possibility, obviously, of, of accessing onto the old county uh, country club road which then in turn would have other street rebuilding matters and so forth. Mm -hmm. But in my view, the, the most long-term advantageous access would be an extension of East State Street, right across Savings Pasture, mm -hmm. onto here, mm -hmm. probably cutting in half the distance that uh, people would have to go where the existing access maintained as the, the primary way to get on here. And um, in terms of the savings pasture question, I would just say that I've talked with uh, one of the owners at some length um, last summer about their interests. And uh, it strikes me that were that kind of access to be created, it would add value, considerable value, to the savings property mm -hmm. and could be, you know, one kind of lever to gain the sort of cooperation that is necessary. And I've got other thoughts, but that's the main okay. thing yeah, that I want to. Can I, can I ask clarity on um, tightly integrated with the city? What is, when you say that, what does that mean for you? I just, I'm not sure if I understand. Well, what process. it means is that, you know, physically, that the access mm -hmm. back and forth yeah. from the build up part of town. <coughs> is simply uh, 
the easiest that you can have. Okay. You know, I thought at the beginning you were saying tightly integrated with the city relative more to the process than actually about access. So I just didn't know if I understood that comment. No, I, I, I'm, well, I, I suppose one way to phrase it would be that um, the means of accomplishing what I'm suggesting should be a goal is more than analyzing the site. Yes, clearly. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. And, and that it's more comprehensive, not site specific, that it needs to look at the context and different opportunities. Right. But, but I think the point yeah. is were there were there efforts made to do what I'm yeah. suggesting, yeah. that would clearly have an impact on what how the site itself was designed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've walked the entire property here at Savings Castro and I've had some professional experience in land use and so forth. And it strikes me that um, there are several ways, which I'm not going to belabor the time to, to outline, that both properties could be developed more efficiently and effectively than separately. Okay. And, uh, I, don't know, I don't think anyone would disagree. Right. I, mean, I think and, there's you know, best practices you know, to have integrated properties and access between properties. That's best practice in right. planning. And, um, and in development, I mean, as a developer, there's efficiencies there that, of course, if it's possible, would be. Yeah. So I think as what you're what you're getting to, and I absolutely agree, is part of our job is to integrate the you know the ideas that come out and the site site opportunities and constraints, but absolutely look at the bigger picture. As we mentioned about you know maybe it needs to be rezoned, maybe it needs a whole designation with some of the surrounding properties in order to make it. What we want the vision to right. be. It may and take. It's not going to. It's not going to stay within the boundaries. Right. And I would just allude to a bit of history in Montpelier, such as the uh, <coughs> the area up Terra Street, which was developed in the fifties. And um, you know, if you look at that and just think of what went on there, well, there's a whole street system and so forth. That was never designed, you know, as a, a single person. And in a way, we've really gotten away from conceiving of a community as something that is rationally integrated in the past few decades, in my own observation. And I think this would be an opportunity to uh, perhaps reverse that trend. No doubt. Thank you. Um, in the back with the green print hat and the bow that Stephanie, as we look at the site plan, would you be kind enough to point out where the late 1800s, early 1900s uh, golf course house was located on that site plan? Getting out of my expertise. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, we have not gone into the history of the site yet. Did you I'm know? not quite sure where the golf house was um, in the early 1900s. I have not seen any documentation showing that. I would urge you to do some research. Yeah, that's part of the due diligence is the historic use of the site as well as the permits that have been issued for the site before, um, any archaeological sensitivity, historic sensitivity. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, we can go to any kind of comment, you know, any, any input or process questions or uh, input. Happy to hear more. I make a comment. I, I didn't see this in any of the statements other people made, but you can see a dog out there walking. We walk our dog here, probably three to three dogs, three to five times a week. And we're not alone. There are dogs here all day long being walked. And I would hope that there's some way we can take that into uh, consideration. I think we're about the only town of any size around here without a dog park. I'd like to add, have you add that to the wish list. And we're recording this too, so even if my notes are as legible, we'll be making sure they're, they're clear. Um, just want to make sure if anyone else has a comment before we come back to someone who spoke about it. Uh, just to add to the wish list, yeah. um, on behalf of my grandchildren, uh, to consider a skate park. I know there's been some conversation about doing one at the current rec center, but this would seem to be actually a much better location that, than that, just because that's already got so much going on there. And, and just, I'll just say that one of the things about a skate park is it's classless. 
the cost of, of doing it Access. is very low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to make sure that if there's going to be recreation here, that mm -hmm. it be available to the entire community. Speaking as a Burlington resident, I completely agree with you. And I will say um, one issue I'll just point out is that there is an issue of access, though, given the proximity to downtown. So some, some might argue that a downtown skate park has more access opportunities. So just to point out what the, there's pros and cons, you know, with all of these things. And that's going to be the, the key in this process is really kind of trying to weigh out how the different, um, the different benefits of doing something versus the opportunities versus the, or the challenges and then versus, you know, something that might take, you know, a lot longer versus, you know, we're in a housing crisis. <laughs> so what, what needs to happen sooner? <laughs> Then later, and so maybe there's phases to this, multi phases, multi year phases, um, and reserved areas for future uses, you know, things like that. So I think we should all keep an open mind in terms of thinking how, um, what the timeline might be for the development, too. Um, I see here, and then, well, actually, yes, why don't we go here first? <laughs> so uh, I want to um, suggest something you, you just said. I think. Uh, at this stage, when you're looking at legacy kind of issues, what Ben said is the worst thing would be that this is a satellite and there's no sort of relationship. And the best thing you said is classless. So I think it's not dog park and skate park and that kind of thing. It's more on a legacy scale. It's the things we want to make sure we didn't leave out or miss the opportunity for. My, my background is in landscape architecture, and so I've done the kind of work you're doing. And knowing what's going on around the edges, you know, the context in which any site sits is, is important. So all the things that you just said are really, I think, legacy issues. Um, and I was at one of the earlier meetings where a lot of the specific kinds of activities showed up. I think what we're we don't want to miss is that we've done something that's very future oriented um, opportunities to maybe be a model for the kind of building that everybody needs to be looking at. And so you want to make sure you don't close doors to things that um, are the big picture issues around it rather than, because we all have a favorite, we want a pool or a tennis court or whatever, and I have my own, but I don't think that's what this meeting is about. Um, the workshops you're going to kind of feel like a charrette of some kind. I don't right. know if that's what right. you would do. It is, yeah. That's the but you would have the data, the site data, and the constraints and opportunities and the context. And the context, context exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's what that's we're But I like what your point, one of your points being like the theme, some of the themes to keep in mind during the process. Right. For example, like the, you know, don't close the door and, and you know, and that's kind of where I was going with like, we may not plan all of it in 2023, you know, it may be that we want to reserve. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know what his grandchildren might want for the site. And that is really important to keep in mind. For the property of this size, you have that, that's, a, that's an opportunity. Um, I saw your hand and then your hand, if that's okay. And then, do you have your hand raised? Yeah. Just we haven't heard from him, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to who we have. Just a really here. quick comment. So yeah. nothing against the room here, but um, I just want to make sure that you might have to actively engage younger people in this, <laughs> because the people who are willing to come out and spend their time doing this are a, a, a different age bracket than yeah. a lot of people who might really be interested in what's going on here and just can't get to it. That's right. And that's going to require actually reaching out to them rather than like, come on in and just join us. Yeah. On like, a just, Saturday afternoon, that's Yeah, or, which or, is any, hard or any time. You know, the, the town needs more things for young people that they can put up that they need for We agree, and there is there's this current outreach phase includes things um, like being a table at a farmer's market and having tables for education and outreach and that, I think, will even heighten more when we're getting into the opportunities and constraints planning part and the phase in the spring, which could look more like what you've seen we, that Montpelier has done before, a lot of communities have done before, where we're at events where there are families, where are, there are um, young folks, where, you know, part, try to get to people that, we, that, that aren't receiving their communications in the traditional channels to be able to, to weigh in on options, you know, and really respond to options, which I think is another type of input that 
you know, this, this group can visualize, some people can't, they want to be able to respond to something. So there's different ways people learn and we're trying to tap into that. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna go, um, I'm again gonna skip around. You've had your hand up for a while, so I'm gonna go to you and then you're in the back and then we're gonna skip to these folks who haven't talked to. I just wanted to give, you're looking for feedback again today. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm of the mind that I'm hoping for more and more housing as opposed to more and more recreation, but we have Hubbard Park, et cetera. But, but um, if we end up finding that a lot of places, uh, people have talked a lot about fields and soccer fields and all this, but my priority is 75% like, housing because young people cannot afford to get a home. Mm -hmm. People coming in from the state are flashing lots of, from out of state are flashing lots of money and putting the prices up and we have moderate priced homes and then some, some you know, lower income homes up here. Well planned, beautiful, and with, you know, yeah. So if it's a lot of ledge out, out with the rest, mm -hmm. then we need these, this field area for right. homes. Right. Yep, do it in, yep, I've got that written down, absolutely. And we'll go back there and then we'll come to the front here. Yeah, uh, just a couple things. One, I'm assuming since we voted for housing and recreation, we'll get a few some of each of those. But I would ask you in terms of legacy, and maybe particularly during the state of pasture, that there be thought put into a trail system that might surround that or be incorporated into that. And then also, um, there was at one point, I can mention it today, use, potential use of this building or some part in terms of a direct department, but I would encourage the examination if it hasn't already been done. I know you guys are also involved in potential use of the college. Mm -hmm. the, there's a big gym there already. Mm -hmm. Is that a viable option for the city, which would be a more central location than the far reach of town? Which this would be. Gotcha. And I meant to say that before. Thank you for reminding me that <clears throat> part of the evaluation is going to be looking at this building and what this building can support, what kind of um, shape condition it's in, you know, generally understanding the feasibility of retrofitting, renovation here um, versus starting from scratch. Um, you know, it's always best practice to try to reuse what you can, and in some cases it's using pieces, and in some uses it's using, reusing the whole thing. So I'd like to go here, um, and then we saw, I saw two, two more comments, but red shirt first, and then... Red shirt. Yes. <laughs> um, is there a way for the tree board to work with DDP, is that the right initials? Um, BHP. BHP, BHP, BHP on yep. the uh, resource analysis regarding old growth trees that may be on this property. Of course, old growth trees in Vermont would be anything over 50 or 60 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, there may actually be much older trees here, but it would be nice to have the tree board be consulting with BHP in order to establish where we may want to do some protection of those trees. Mm -hmm. I w I've noted that. Um, let me talk with them, and, and I we'll, t we'll circle back, because I think the tree board has been on a list of stakeholders we need to be talking with, and at what point, you know, for example, if the, the area of the most growth is already considered not developable for other reasons, then it makes sense that those won't be the nodes for development. So we, we can just figure out the phase, though. But thank you for bringing that up. I have that written down now. This, so. this property has been in current use. So there, there are some portions of it that have trees that are quite long, particularly on the, the right-hand side, that block. Um, let's go to the person right behind you, and then we'll go back to you. Um, uh, on the subject of paths and trails, mm -hmm. There's already a really nice network of paths courtesy of the golf carts. And so to the extent possible as development takes place to leave those intact when they're lovely bike path, bike paths, pedestrian paths, and crisscross the property. Obviously some of them broken up and there's pressure broken, but they can be installed. It's just it's they're already there. Yeah, wherever reuse is possible for sure. Um, I know some have seen 
you know, some impact already just from wear and tear and frost teams and things like that. So, you know, but I, I do totally get that. And I think one of the, the goals for the site that came out of the early, you know, work done or the early comments and uh, will be one of our recommendations is to do smart development, energy efficiency uses mm -hmm. wherever um, that includes from construction through, mm -hmm. you know, from development, you know, impact to the actual construction of the other buildings. And so that would be one of the most important features is reuse. So, um, and did you have your hand up? Yeah. I just have like a general comment to the room, not directly to you, but kind of bouncing off from what you're saying about getting young people. I think it's obvious that I'm the youngest one here, except for those got the little one. You got an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Represent. But I'm gonna say we, as in my age group, we don't feel welcome here. We don't feel like we can afford to live here, that we can buy here. We want to raise our families here, just like all the rest of you have. But we can't afford it. So that's why we have to work with something like this. We don't care about tennis courts. We want a safe, good community to raise our kids in. And there's just too many people that are stopping that for some ridiculous reason or not, just because people don't like change. But we have to think about all the people that changed so you guys can buy houses here and the rest of us want to be able to buy houses here. Okay, um, we'll go from here. Um, in response to that, I have to say that I've been in town for 10 years. I bought a house when it was much less expensive than it would be now. If I have to sell my house, I will not be able to afford to stay in my place. Mm -hmm. So it's not just young people who want to come to town. I would like to stay here. I like this community. There's a critical affordability piece There's at, at every at yeah. every step. Yeah. So small, small, very small, very energy efficient. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so others, was there anyone on this side of the room that I missed that had their hand up? Okay, sorry. I want to get to those folks who haven't spoken yet, and then we'll come back on this side. That was the first question. Yep. Blue. And then before the director of board to go, I'm just curious because. I don't know. What's the status of the pump proposal to what, take this building and renovate it? Is that the plan? Or? So there, I mean, that's all being considered as part of this master plan. So there's no commitments made. It's something okay. they've been in regular communication with us about their goals and then this group, and uh, they'll be actively participating in the process. Um, but, you know, the community owns the property, so right. it's got to be what works for. Yeah, I'm just curious whether that was a source of revenue that could come into the city relatively quickly and help. Yeah, they, you know, we've been in, we have been in lease negotiations with them, and so far we haven't reached an agreement yet. Okay. And then I guess a comment from a planning standpoint <clears throat> VHB is probably the most comprehensive group in the country, in the Vermont, to do the work that Stephanie's hired them to do, the way in Berkeley's hired them. And doing this analysis completely from the beginning is the way to go for all of us to ultimately get the plan of what's the happening. And unless you understand on the site completely, you can't come up with any of the ideas that everybody has here, which are all great. But from a planning standpoint, the way they're taking this is the direction to go that's going to support that. Thank you. And then in that corner, did I see? Yeah. I, I was just, uh, something that resonated with me earlier was the term classless. I, I, I would like to see classless homes be built here. Um, so many homes that we we can offer a space for young families or older folks or anybody who really wants to live here. But not like these these ones were built. You know, these are the low income ones and these are the upper income ones. Just classless building. Um, and I'd also like us to be thinking about using green building materials. And also thinking about how we can make um, green living as, as much as possible. Maybe it's you know rooftop gardens. I don't know. Maybe it's solar. Maybe it's a lot of windows so that the the sun can can heat the homes and just just making use of what we have here and also uh, paying attention to that this idea of legacy. Um, we don't want to leave a footprint here that that made a mess of stuff. We really want it to be done correctly so that we can keep our environment into the future and people will want to continue to come from um, I think we had over here and then we'll come back over here. 
I had not wanted to speak more than once, but <laughs> the issue that she brought up about the cost of homes, I, I, I want to comment on. Just a tiny bit of experience. Um, one of my sons, who was born here, went away to college, started his career, has had a really hard time. He and his wife moved back a year ago and are paying through the nose for a house with, I won't go into the problems of their attempting to pull this off, which so far they have. But it's clearly going to become more pronounced with climate refugees and those who are well off being the first people to come here, making the prices even higher. Mm -hmm. And it occurs to me that one approach could be to model something on Habitat with Humanity, where that particular program requires a certain level, a low level, level of income to be eligible for it. Mm -hmm. But it allows people to contribute their own sweat, you know, as the term of art, to building the house and to make it affordable for them. And something like that is one of the few things that occurs to me that could, in fact, make it more reasonable for people to be able to build here. And um, it would ob obviously require additional funding from other sources to, to permit that. But I, I really think something like that needs to be seriously thought about. And, and can I ask, because um, I'm, I'm a newbie in this, are there any members of the housing committee present here today? Okay. So, um, you know, that is something, for example, that we want to bring back if, you know, if and when we get to, well, housing is going to be a part of it no matter what. So when we get to the point of, you know, figuring out the different options of where housing can be, the question is what kind of housing? And the question is, um, you know, what's most in demand, but what's also, um, what's financially feasible, which of course in this current construction climate is like impossible. I mean, there's a lot of housing conferences going on right now that are talking about the um, cost of construction and ways to leverage different resources, st stacking capital, all the different sources to be able to make this possible. Um, but I do think one of the conversations needs to be around the different types of housing, the mix, and also, you know, I'll just say it, I think, you know, the, the crisis is now, and for the past year or two, it's not getting better right now. So, you know, while we want to do a really diligent job of planning, you know, and, and making sure we, we have the best foundation we have, we also want to put into place the steps that can happen sooner rather than later. Because the story you're telling about your uh, family member, the story she shared, that's happening everywhere. So the sooner the better on, in some way to, to be able to get something under construction to satisfy, help start stemming the, the flow, of the, the hemorrhage of what we're, what we're having, experiencing here. So there is a balance here that I think the city council especially is going to end up being kind of the ultimate guide for what that vision is, and that's going to be the balance that needs to be discussed. Um, so we, I, I think you had your hand back yep. up first. And then and, uh, I'll try to make it really brief. Um, in terms of the housing, if, if there was also uh, attention paid to downsizers who might move out of bigger houses in town, mm -hmm. that would be a uh, space and maybe pricing for a bigger house. Who's going to say that when she mentioned that? It's like downsizing isn't even possible right now across the state. It's yeah. not It's not unique to North Carolina. So, yes, you know, great. You know, when I dovetail on what uh, Fran just said, uh, basically there is a, a downsizing group of about right. 100 plus members in right. town. Yeah. And for all of us who are going to age out of our houses at some point, you know, trying to maintain and just maneuver a, 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 a big Victorian, which most of the housing stock in Montpelier right. is, I mean, we're looking for alternatives as far yeah. as something that will accommodate us as we age. So it's an aging place. Absolutely aging place, yeah, absolutely. Um, just, I don't pretend to be an expert in this, but yesterday, in fact, the, the Vermont town managers, city managers were briefed by Josh Hanford, the Commissioner of Housing. And I think it's important to understand the struggle. You know, I, I think we all agree with the goals that have been articulated here. We were told that right now, even in, um, you know, multifamily housing, the average cost per unit in Vermont right now is $400,000 per unit to construct a unit. So, when you're talking about, you know, 
projects that to use Stephanie's word pencil out uh, financially. The reason more expensive homes are being built is those are the ones you can sell and make profit. So as we consider these options, I think we as a community need to think about what are we prepared to invest in the project to make the results that we want to see. And so, you know, there will be debates and future votes. And, you know, we've purchased this land. We control our own destiny, which is actually unusual. Are we, you know, are we going to consider giving these lots away? Are we going to consider construction infrastructure and not asking a developer to contribute in order to get the price that we want? I'm not saying we will do any of that, but as a community, those are the kinds of things that need to happen. The state right now is awash in money uh, from the federal programs, and a lot of it is going to housing. Their, one of their number one programs is actually to provide grants to developers to reduce the cost and to the homeowners to reduce their price so that they can actually meet the gap and buy, buy a house, which, by the way, we're talking about between $250,000 and $350,000 as sort of what the average person can afford. So that's, where, that's the state of housing in, in Vermont right now. It's, it's not just one thing. It's everywhere. And um, so... That's Just as we think about this, it's, it's, those are the realities we will be dealing with when we talk about how do we create classless housing, how do we create a range of housing, is how do you make this all work uh, financially and what, are, what, what, if anything, because certainly a fair comment to say, hey, this is private housing, the city shouldn't put any money into it, right? Let's let the market drive it. That's, a, that's one fair outcome as is the city should put in a lot to get these outcomes. So be thinking about that over the next year. It's a really good point, and I had wanted to circle back to something um, similar, akin to that, which is that um, in our work and the work of our peers in the economic development consulting space, we are working with many municipalities who are taking a vested interest. They are actually being proactive and getting in the driver's seat to actually make housing possible in their communities. And it's on somewhere on the really small scale. We're doing some work in Manchester right now. They have a property, and they put it out to bid to see who might come forward and then they can guide how that development happens but you know it at least it puts them in a position of being able to put some skin in the game and really i mean using the tools that a municipality a public sector has available to it that a private sector does not and i mean you can say what you want and you have different experiences with different developers but there are a lot of good developers out there that are just really not trying to make an, an outrageous you know, a bet of profit here, but they have to, if they're running a business, they have to see the ROI, and the numbers just don't work. That's why we're in the situation we're in. That's not, there, this is this didn't happen by magic. I mean, we're here because the, the construction environment, it costs as much to build here in Montpelier as it does in Burlington, as it does in St. Jay. Mm -hmm. But you can only get certain rent in St. Jay. You can only get certain rent in Montpelier, and you can even, there's a limit in Burlington. I mean, I know so many people who are saying, you know, I'll just, you know, I can just get a place in Burlington. I want to move to Burlington. It's that, I mean, that's not feasible either. It's just because, you know, the costs are just really out of whack. And so the municipalities are taking a more active approach. Not to say that may happen here, but it's the way that you can leverage different resources to be able to get that outcome that you're, that you're trying to get to, the kind of product you want, the kind of um, resources you want to provide to your citizens. So there are lots of different pathways. That part of our work is going to be making those recommendations, looking at funding sources. If you were to put in the infrastructure, if you were to connect some roads, you know, how do you leverage municipal dollars that um, you can you can get access to uh, that a private developer could um, yes we can go here and over there. I'm, I'm curious whether there's obstacles in the way because it seems like it's potentially quicker with all the big old homes in town that couldn't be turned into two or three units uh, that, that that could be unless it's not allowed and I don't know the answer to that but it seems like there's a lot of creative people who could take a dwelling and make it work for three or four families. I can't, I can't totally speak to that necessarily today, but yeah, I mean, a lot of that is, I mean, sometimes, right now, retrofitting and renovating is not any cheaper than new construction. It's so expensive no matter what, and there's no, because there's no contractors, there's not available labor, so it's just very expensive. So even that is becoming more of a challenge, but that's historically been done a lot. I mean, there's a lot of multifamily here and elsewhere that started as single family. Um, and, so we'll go to, yes. One quick one, and maybe to build again. So here's a discussion about all the variety of uses that everybody dreams about happening here, and hope we can make it happen. And someone earlier asked about zoning. I have no idea what this is, the role of zoning. 
it may make sense or consideration for you to charge the planning commission, state planning commission, to start now in establishing what's called a PUD, that we could provide maximum flexibility for future, all these future ideas. Because this is just rural zoning that had a two acre minimum lot size or whatever. None of this can happen. So if you get the planning commission to create a special planning and development zone allowing maximum flexibility here, then when the plans come together, rather than, oh, we can't do that, the zoning restrictions are too strict, we don't have to revise the zoning, start it today, go through the process, which as you know, takes a while, and get them to think about what can we create here from the zoning standpoint that allows maximum flexibility for us, the town and the city, to move forward with the plans when we get ready to go. Just to I, that work's being done. Josh is part of the planning department. Uh, planning director's been actively involved in this process, so we, we are very much on top of that. Thank you, though. Um, and then, is that, yeah, right here. The limitation on this piece of land is the access to it from um, through two. And I guess any ideas we want to have on the land is going to have a traffic pattern, and the traffic pattern is going to depend on who goes what, when, and where. Mm -hmm. And to, and the access is so bad that it's dangerous. And my thinking is that it's going to actually go back to the traffic circle and, and whatever else is on Darden on Ferry Road. Uh, so, when you think about uses on the land, it, it's, got to, it's going to go back into costing Montpelier some additional funds for traffic regulation, mm -hmm. for traffic control. So I think that should be part of your analysis. Uh, and it's not just the average daily traffic flow, it's when that traffic flow will occur. I mean, if, if this is all housing, and that is the solution, that's going to be a great outpouring onto that traffic system. And it's going to be costing a lot of money, and it's going to cause a lot of headaches. So, you know, a mixed pattern of use, or just no use at all, that attracts intense traffic at a certain time of the year, may be the optimum because of the costs that are going to have to be borne from the rest of the city what you raise is actually a good example of what I was saying that in the, at the, in the winter phase we may want to have some sessions and workshops, some ideas, and then we may want more research. Like we may want more traffic assessment for various scenarios and then have another interim step before we come back with some uh, two or three scenarios because, for example, it could be a deal killer if you have, you know, a, a, it could be a full stop if there's a big traffic impact with one particular having all your, your housing clustered on one end of the site, for example. So I think that's a good example and definitely something to be considered. And you know, it's another example of the kind of, well, this may cost more you know, to do the infrastructure upgrade, but it's going to get us this. And is that what the city wants? And so that, those are going to be the choices. Um, it is, I'm being mindful of time, it's 2.07, and we wanted to make sure we give a good amount of time for the walk. Um, but does anyone have any further comments? Because we do have about 10 more minutes if we want to talk more here. Otherwise, we're going to break into some groups, and um, Josh will kind of leave that a little bit. But any further comments? I've written all this down. We've got it recorded. Again, this we're going to be having another one of these sessions um, next Wednesday night at City Hall, and another on uh, via Zoom um, the following week during the day. So again, trying to give people some people feel more comfortable, you know, being virtual right now still with pandemic conditions and, you know, it'll be during the daytime. Some people can make that during lunch. So different ways for people to have this exact same opportunity minus the walk. And then, you know, additional education and outreach, um, which I think the education piece will definitely ramp up more when we have more known about the site and more um, things to respond to. So, um, and so as always, um, Emailing Josh is, is, a, is a great conduit for getting that into the, the funnel. 
And if you take photos today, we welcome you to send those to him as well. Um, if you're out on site taking photos of things that are particularly um, high, higher assets that you want to see retained, things that you hate, go ahead, take pictures of that too, send them to him with captions to make it clear. Um, but those kinds of, uh, that kind of um, visual data can be really helpful for the planning team, but as well as bringing that back to the public. Anything more you want to say about the walk? Yeah, uh, can I get maybe a show of hands who anticipates going for a walk? So that have an idea? Great, thank you. We're just going to meet out here, uh, right outside the building here, and, and kind of break up into some smaller groups in the same direction. Yes.